Welcome to the Manly Saints Project with me, Hugh Hunter. We live in a world that struggles to understand the virtue of manliness. Our culture doesn't provide young men, or any men for that matter, with a lot of positive male role models. But our Christian tradition can provide such role models. The stories of the saints provide example after example of manly virtue. Telling these stories is what the Manly Saints Project is all about. If you enjoy my work, please consider signing up and supporting me on Substack, or click the link in the show notes to buy me a beer. And if you enjoy the podcast as audio or video, please consider giving me a rating wherever you are. It helps a lot. Now, let's meet this week's Manly Saint. Join me today to meet the patron saint of politicians and statesmen. Name, Sir Thomas More. Life, 1477 or 8 to 1535. Status, Saint. Feast, June 22nd. The year was 1518 and Thomas More was being invited, some would say pressured, to come and work for King Henry VIII of England. Henry VIII was shedding his rowdy entourage and taking on a more kingly demeanor. Who better to become his advisor than England's most famous humanist? But More's first inclination was to turn the king down. Moore had already accomplished more than most, and the king could offer him little that he did not already have. Many people went to court to get rich. Thomas Moore was already wealthy. In fact, to go into the king's service would mean taking a big pay cut. Other people went into the king's service for the sake of honors. But Moore had already earned so many titles and distinctions that he didn't need any more. For others still, going into the king's service meant freedom. For more, it meant the opposite. He was currently a powerful man in the fairly free city of London. Working for the king meant less freedom, not more. There was also the off chance that if Moore went to work for Henry VIII, the king might do something that would put Moore's faith to the test. But that at least seemed unlikely. No one was more Catholic than Henry VIII. In 1521, the king would write an attack on the new Protestant theology emerging in Europe. Thomas More read the draft and advised Henry that he might be giving the Pope a little too much credit. Henry scoffed. It was impossible to give the Pope too much credit. King Henry didn't have anything to tempt Moore to come work for him. But as Moore considered the offer, he looked at it from the point of view of duty rather than personal gain. Not duty to the king. Moore's thinking was bigger than that. He began to think of his duty to Christendom as a whole and to the church. Perhaps, as advisor to the king, he could address the great issues of his age. Moore said yes. The reason why Henry VIII wanted Thomas More to come and work for him was that by this time, Moore was among the most accomplished men in England. Moore hadn't been born to greatness. He came from a middle-class family. His father had pulled strings and landed him a job as a page for the man who was, at the time, the Lord Chancellor of England. The job meant learning all the little details of ceremony and custom, and watching how powerful nobles behaved and expected to be treated. Thomas was drinking it all in. Powerful men occasionally liked to joke with the pages, or ask them hard questions that put them on the spot. When they tried it with Thomas More, they found he could banter right back with them, 
stepping in and out of their conversations to do his work. The Chancellor was so impressed with his young page that he saw to it that Thomas More had a spot at Oxford University. After two years at Oxford, Thomas More came back to London to finish his studies in law. At first, his father was delighted. But after graduating, Thomas More did something that disappointed his father. He kept studying. More was studying the work of the Renaissance humanists, whose attitude is often summed up in the Latin phrase ad fontes, which means to the sources. These sources were the Greek and Latin texts of the ancient world. The focus on the sources was what separated the Renaissance from the Middle Ages. It wasn't that Greek and Latin sources had been neglected or lost during the Middle Ages, of course. The difference was a difference of intent. The medieval project, really the core idea of medieval thought, had been to take Greek and Roman sources and meld them with Christianity. A thinker like St. Thomas Aquinas quotes Aristotle just as he quotes the Bible. The whole point is to make Aristotle and Scripture speak with one voice. But the Renaissance recognized that such a reconciliation was bound to leave some sources out. And, maybe the medieval project had become a little bit stagnant. So, the solution was to return to the sources, ad fontes, and re-examine them on their own merits. Thomas More spent the next few years drinking in these humanist ideas. He studied Greek, philosophy, history, theology, and literature. In a few years, His command of Greek was so good that he befriended, then collaborated with, Europe's most famous humanist, Erasmus. For a few years, Moore wondered whether he was being called to the priesthood. He prayed and thought and found that the answer was no. And so, several years late, Moore finally did what his father wanted him to do. He opened a legal firm, he got married, and he went into local government. Moore would be one of the men who would show that the liberal arts were not only a luxury. They could be the makings of a statesman. At first, Moore took what he could get as far as local government went. He was put in charge of London's sewers. But, in the course of his work, he ended up dealing with an association of London's merchants. The merchants were so impressed by Moore that they asked him to represent them to Parliament. He did, and started making connections at Parliament. Soon, Moore entered Parliament himself. Other guilds and organizations asked Moore to lead them, and he did. Then, The city of London asked Moore to take on a law enforcement role as undersheriff. He gained a reputation in London as a man who was fair, merciful, and who enforced the law rather than helping his friends. Later, the playwrights of London would remember him as the best friend that the poor heir had. By now, Moore was busy all the time traveling abroad to conduct guild negotiations, then returning to his complex life in London. And as Moore went from one honor to the next, he kept up his scholarship. He and Erasmus translated Greek satires. Moore wrote poetry. He also wrote philosophy, including what is today his most famous work, Utopia, about a faraway land governed, perhaps, on rational principles. Moore's title is a Greek pun, and it frames the concept of utopia to this day. The ending of the word, topia, comes from the Greek topos, which means place. But the U in utopia 
could be one of two Greek words. It could be eu, which would render the meaning of utopia as good place. Or the word could be u, which would translate as non-place. The point of a utopia is that both words are correct. The truly good place is always a non-place, always only an ideal. Moore wrote about utopias, but he didn't imagine that he lived in one. He was working out his political philosophy, drawing on the ancient sources to better understand his time. A healthy state would be one where the king regarded his people as an extension of himself, and where he regarded their prosperity as his own prosperity. Moore put it like this, A devoted king will never lack children. He is father to the whole kingdom. And so it is that a true king is abundantly blessed in having as many children as he has citizens. So, Thomas Moore, in his forties, was a man of intellect. He wasn't physically imposing, standing at average height with a thin beard, dark hair, piercing gray-blue eyes, and, rather incongruously for a scholar, rough hands you'd expect to see on someone who worked with them. He smiled easily. Moore could be very funny, but he always spoke with precision and self-control. When other people panicked, he was calm. Moore's son-in-law lived in the family home for 16 years, and in all that time, he said, he never once saw Moore lose his cool. No wonder Henry VIII wanted such a man at his court. Why, though, did Moore agree to work for Henry? The answer is that Moore hoped to address two major problems. The first problem was war. Pointless war. Europeans were killing one another for minor gains in land. As Europe's attention was focused inward, the Christians of Constantinople had fallen to the powerful Ottoman Turks a few decades before Moore's birth. Now, the threat of Islam crept closer and closer, but no one had the will to do anything about it. As advisor to a powerful king, Moore could push for peace in Europe and a refocusing on the common enemy. The second problem was reform in the church. The church should have been calling Christendom to its senses. Instead, it had become corrupt. Over in what would become Germany, a priest named Martin Luther was risking excommunication by blasting the church hierarchy for their many mistakes. But the truth was that Luther had a point. The church did need reform. The question was how to do that without destabilizing Christendom. Moore hoped that working for King Henry would let him address those two problems. But before taking the job, Moore spoke to Henry about his reservations. What would happen, Moore asked, if he found that in the king's service, service to God pulled him in one direction, and service to the king in another? Easy, said Henry. Follow God. As Moore would later report, Henry said that he should look first unto God, and after God, unto him. And so it was that Thomas Moore became a personal secretary to Henry Tudor, King of England. And for a little while, things worked well. Henry found Moore's arguments persuasive and put a halt to his fighting in France. Thomas Moore was made a knight, becoming Sir Thomas Moore. Friends compared him to the Roman Cicero, because Cicero was a statesman who was also a philosopher. Later, that comparison would turn out to have been prophetic, for Cicero stood up against powerful men for the sake of the Roman Republic, and died for daring to do so. Things in Europe 
seemed to justify Thomas More's decision to come and work for the king. Over in Germany, Luther was excommunicated. But far from being silenced, Luther got louder. More worried that Luther's rhetoric would unleash chaos in Europe, just when Christians needed to come together. And as if to emphasize the point, in 1522, the might of the Ottoman Turks descended on the island of Rhodes, the headquarters of the Knights Hospitaller, who had been in a fighting retreat from the Holy Land for 300 years. The Knights were driven back to the island of Malta, where they prepared to make their last stand. But Europe's attention was elsewhere, in Germany, where, exactly as Moore had feared, Luther's writings were making ordinary people question the place of the church. This created a power vacuum, and that vacuum led to chaos. Revolution washed over modern Germany, Switzerland, and Austria, the so-called peasant revolts. It was a bloodbath. Soon, 60,000 peasants had died, and Luther was trying to distance himself from the whole thing with his book Against the Robbing and Murdering Hordes of Peasants. All but unnoticed in all this, in 1522, a new face had showed up in Henry's orbit. Two sisters had attended a royal tournament. Henry noticed one of them, a beautiful, petite woman in her late teens or early twenties. Her name was Anne Boleyn. Thomas More continued to grow in influence. In 1523, he became Speaker of the House of Commons. But More had noticed a flaw in King Henry that had him worried. Henry was very susceptible to taking bad advice from those who flattered him. Moore's friend, Erasmus, presented the king with a pointed gift, a translation of an ancient text about how to tell a friend from a flatterer. As the years passed, Henry VIII grew worried that his wife, Catherine of Aragon, had not provided him with a son to be his heir. Clearly the problem was not Henry, he already had an illegitimate son, Henry Fitzroy. Henry came to think that if only he could marry Anne Boleyn, he would have sons and all would be well. He set about trying to get his marriage annulled by the church. In the meantime, Moore had risen to become the king's Lord Chancellor. Despite being busy nearly all the time, Moore liked to be in his office in the afternoons with the door open to anyone who wanted to come in and make a complaint or ask for help. The kindness he had shown to the poor in London was now on display for all. As Chancellor, Moore overturned a number of legal judgments that were legally correct but unfair. When judges complained, Moore invited them over for dinner, then went through the cases with them, asking them not what was legal, but what was right. They reluctantly found themselves agreeing with him, but protested that they were bound by the law. Moore told them to feel free to keep making such rulings. He would be happy to keep overturning them. Moore was busy pushing for peace in Europe, but with little success. He was having better luck with religion. Moore was promoting a sensible, literary form of Catholicism. He was also willing to take his own side. Protestants and Catholics were competing for the same souls, and Moore understood that to hesitate to use political power for his side meant yielding to the other side. For as long as he was chancellor, Moore cracked down on Protestants, blasting both Luther and William Tyndale, who was promoting his New English Bible. Moore read Greek, too, and found the translation subpar. Looking for mistakes in Tyndale's Bible, he said, was a bit like looking for water in the ocean. As time passed, 
Moore realized his goals of peace and church reform were dependent on a third goal, fixing Henry VIII's marriage with Catherine. As Moore told his son-in-law, if it would secure these three goals, he would gladly hop into a sack and let his enemies toss him into the River Thames. But, as Henry VIII's marriage grew more and more troubled, he was coming into conflict with his chancellor. It started with Henry VIII asking Moore for advice on the situation with Anne. Henry wanted the church to annul his marriage to Catherine. This was unlikely to happen, because there was really nothing wrong with that marriage, and besides, Queen Catherine had powerful friends in Europe. Moore explained why an annulment was not a good idea, and Henry listened. But he kept coming back and asking the same question. Moore realized that there was only one answer Henry was really prepared to hear. When the church declined to annul Henry's marriage, Henry grew more and more angry. Then he took a drastic step. He nationalized the church, putting himself at its head. This also meant that Henry suddenly claimed many of the lands that had been given to churches and monasteries over the centuries. Moore watched in horror as Henry ruined everything Moore had been trying to build. By 1532, Moore had stepped down as chancellor. He wanted no part in what was happening. The next year, King Henry's marriage was declared invalid by the spineless Archbishop Cranmer. Henry married Anne Boleyn and crowned her queen. Thomas More refused to attend the ceremony. Things were changing so fast that the church had not yet caught up. Only a few years earlier, the Pope had been calling Henry VIII a defender of the faith. Now, the Pope began threatening excommunication. But Henry was doubling down on his new way. He insisted that everyone swear an oath that would establish Anne Boleyn's children as his legitimate heirs. Moore thought that the oath was probably wrong-headed, but since it stated that Henry was head of the church, Moore absolutely refused to sign it. And so, in 1534, Moore was arrested and imprisoned. Moore had now fallen from power, but he still had his learning. And so, for the next year, he used his literary gifts to wage a cultural war against what he saw as Henry's mistakes. Moore wrote work after work, and soon public opinion, especially in Europe, was turning against Henry. The Holy Roman Emperor at the time thought Henry was crazy to lose Moore's advice. The Emperor, a man used to weighing the value of things, said that if Moore was his advisor, he'd sooner lose the biggest city in his empire than do without him. Of course, Moore also faced criticism for his principled stand. Some of his friends advised compromise. But Moore could see that if Henry had his way, it would be one compromise after the next. In one of his writings, published during his arrest, Moore made it clear where he stood and what he was willing to sacrifice. Although I know full well my own frailty and the natural faintness of my own heart, if I had not yet trusted that God would give me strength rather to endure all things than to offend him by blasphemously swearing against my own conscience, you can be very sure I would not have come here. The king's new advisors realized what needed to be done. They found a man named Rich to testify that he had heard Moore making treasonous remarks about the king, in Rich's own words, maliciously, traitorously, diabolically. It was a ridiculous accusation since the famously close-lipped Moore hardly even knew Rich 
Even if Moore had been treasonous, Rich would not have been his confidant. In the trial, Moore tore the evidence against him to shreds. But the trial was only ever going to finish in one way. Moore was found guilty of treason, and the punishment was death. And so it was that Sir Thomas More, humanist, once Lord Chancellor of England, found himself climbing the rickety stairs of a platform where he would be beheaded. Even the executioner was a little intimidated and uncertain, but Moore encouraged him to do what he had to do. Moore was thinking of another saint, another lawyer, who had gone to his death centuries before, St. Cyprian. Taking a leaf from Cyprian's book, Moore also tipped the executioner. Moore died in a world where a corrupt status quo was resisting a reform movement that threatened to burn everything down. Moore's middle way would have turned England into a bastion of tradition, Christendom's fortress. But with his death, that middle way became harder and harder to follow. His last words would echo through Europe. I die the king's good servant and God's first. Mm-hmm.